Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Local Government Insights Podcast, Modernizing Government Leadership, your source and insight for local government technology. My name is Brennan Middleton, and today we have with us legendary public administrator, Merritt Steerheim. Welcome to the show, Merritt. It's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. So for those listening real briefly here, Mr. Sterheim started as a government intern and rose to become the manager of what was the largest commission manager government in the United States. Not once, but twice. We're going to find out how he did it, what advice he has for those interested in rising in the ranks of local government, and what he sees as the biggest challenges facing anyone today who serves in public administration. So we have lots to talk about what's included. What's including is his encounters with three U.S. presidents and a queen of England and a whole lot more. So let's just jump right to it, Meredith, if that's okay with you. All right. So you were the county manager for Miami-Dade County and were responsible for running what you described as a $6 billion government with 27,000 employees. When you started working as an intern for the city of Miami, my first question was, did you ever think in your wildest dreams that one day you'd be running Miami-Dade County government? Not at first, but keep in mind, I was there for nine years and uh, started out as an intern, Horton intern, and then I was assistant to and then assistant city manager. The city manager that I worked for, his name was Mel Reese, and he really had plans to be the county manager, indicating to me on several occasions that if he did go over there. He wanted to bring me with him. <clears throat> so, and I knew every single manager that the county had since the adoption of the Home Rule Charter for Metro Dade County. But towards the end, I did have thoughts that maybe one day that would be a wonderful career advancement and an opportunity. But, you know, I didn't lose any sleep over it. A lot of things had to happen in order to, you know, to arrive there. Fortunately, they did. So when you talk about career planning, like, did you have your career in your mind planned out or did you just kind of take a life of its own as like new opportunities presented themselves? What did that look like, that journey? When I got out of the Air Force, uh, I was a, went through Air Force cadets and I was a lieutenant and a crew navigator. I really, uh, my undergraduate degree was commerce and finance, and I envisioned a career in the business community. And uh, I wanted to go and and uh, and get my uh, MBA at, at uh, Wharton. And I was accepted, but I didn't have enough money. And then I had received advice from a political science professor at Bucknell, who advised me to fill out two applications and send the second application also to Wharton, but to the Fells Institute, which I did. And I had made an appointment to go to Wall Street with a two-year training program when I received a letter from the Fells Institute wow. accepting me with a full scholarship. Wow. I wanted a master's degree, and here I sure. could get one. And yeah. he apologized. They'd given out the fellowships, but I could compete academically for one, and I got that. So I had the GI Bill. And I had a $150 fellowship and my wife and children, we could survive very nicely on that. That's fantastic. That's a great story, by the way. Um, let's jump over to my, let's go back to Miami just for a moment. Like the, the journey, you were an intern, then assistant to the city manager, then assistant city manager until you were offered the position as ultimately city manager at Clearwater. That's correct. What do you think was, my, my question kind of stems along that journey, like, what do you think was the secret to your success in Miami that helped you rise to the ranks so quickly? Well, we never had a lot of staff in the manager's office. <clears throat> and um, so I had a lot of challenging assignments. And yeah. um, so I had a lot of experience, nine years. Um, and a lot happened during those nine years in the city and with the commission and so forth and so on. Um, I was very intent on continuing to learn and take opportunities. I had one experience where I, the manager told me early on the first few months I was there to go to a beautification committee meeting. And I went there and to make a story short, um, this chairman introduced me and everybody was dressed up like it was a Sunday 
afternoon tea party or something. And he said, well, Merritt Steinheim is here and he's an assistant city manager, which I was an intern. And he'll have an answer to the question. And I didn't even know what they were talking about. And I, uh, <laughs> it was very embarrassing. I uh, got out of there as quickly as I could. And within two days, I joined Toastmasters International. And I had wow. had debating in college and so forth, but that was one of the most educational and fun experiences of my life. I even created two uh, Toastmaster organizations in two of the jurisdictions that I later managed. Um, yeah. So I attribute that to part of my success. Uh, but I was, you know, ethically never really challenged in those nine years, and uh, but had a lot of good experience. That's fantastic. And I want to spend just a moment talking about just the difference in assistant city manager and the city manager role. Like, fast forward, you're now running your own government for the first time, really, in your career in Clearwater. Um, did you find that easier than being the assistant city manager in Miami or more difficult because you were sort of in charge? And what, what did that look like? And how did you approach that, that change? It was more fun. Uh, <laughs> I was happier. <laughs> Mr. Reese, uh, with all due respect, while he was ethically, uh, very ethical in his conduct, he was an autocratic kind of manager. And I have said in a book that I'm writing that without disrespecting him, because uh, he lasted many years, um, I really learned in a way how not to manage. Because my management style is not uh, autocratic at all. I like to empower people. I think yeah. empowering your staff and so forth, giving them responsibility, praising them when they do a good job and so forth and so on, is a much healthier environment. And I was able in Clearwater to apply those management principles in my, and I was very well received. I had a wonderful mayor and city commission that only wanted the right thing and the best thing for the city. So those six years um, were just a wonderful experience. I was very happy um, and I was well received. I was very popular in the community and in, in St. Petersburg and to the Tampa area, I built quite a bit of a reputation as a no nonsense, but effective public manager. Right. That's fantastic. And from a career de development perspective, Merritt, I want to, I want to pick your brain for a moment for, so a lot of our listeners routinely, you know, well over a thousand local government leaders like yourself and at all levels of government tune into this show. And some of the the, the most common feedback we get in the comments and some of the email responses to our episodes. We've had customers that from Avenue who sponsors the show on a lot of them are like, can you, can you put out some informative uh, informative content around career development? And I'm so excited to talk to you about this because for anyone thinking of becoming a city manager, like particularly someone who's already an assistant city manager, or department head or any really level, like what strategic advice would you give them to sort of win a position like that? That because as you know, they're, they're pretty hard to come by and probably more importantly, hard to keep once you have it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I have watched uh, a lot of very young and professional uh, managers grow. When I was county manager in, in uh, Miami-Dade County, we would every year have seven, eight, nine interns. We would advertise nationally. We get as many as six or 700 applications for master's degree internships from the, the best colleges and universities across the country. Some of those people just kept coming up and getting promoted and so forth in the county. Some of them left to become city managers. Two of them became county managers later first woman and another young man that uh, I remember meeting when he started. And then several years later, uh, he became the county manager. Um, we had a very progressive administration, very professional. I was not tolerant of any hanky panky or misrepresentations of the truth. I encouraged people. We even 
paid sometimes for a talented person to go back to college, go to night school. Um, we had training programs. I brought in some of the best uh, authorities in the country, people that have written books. I could mention names that uh, that some of their books are still selling and still very popular to address all of my department directors and my executive staff. Um, it was a wholesome and healthy environment. And you, you hit a key point there, and I kind of want to make a shift just for a, a few minutes. And And you talked about people transitioning from sort of city government to county government and vice versa, right? So after running Clear, Clearwater for a bit as a city manager, you went off to be the county manager for Pinellas County. Uh, was, there a big, was there a big difference in running a city versus a county? Yes, uh, to, their, to a certain extent, because counties are creatures of the state. Um, and uh, they're really an extension of the three-tiered uh, system of governance. And um, of course, one of the challenges I had in Pinellas County is shortly after I assumed my responsibility, which I might add, I said I wouldn't touch that job with a 10 foot pole. And that was because they were going through county administrators. The average was about 14 months or 16 months, something like that. Right. It was politically very, very unstable. Three of the five commissioners hired me were convicted and sent to jail for zoning payoffs, Pinellas County. Now, the good wow. news is that their transgressions took place before I came. <laughs> so I have no stigma from that. <laughs> good news. Ruben, good Askew news. <laughs> Ruben Askew was the governor, and he appointed three outstanding former mayor of St. Petersburg, a woman that was a former state senator, a a county commissioner who was a city commissioner when I was hired. He was one of the commissioners that hired me initially. And uh, they were terrific. And uh, we moved Pinellas County out of the stone age of politics and so forth. And uh, we got a lot done. I mean, there's a long list of accomplishments. Uh, one of the ones that I'm most proud of is uh, I got four votes out of five to adopt a tax in the unincorporated area, property tax. And the reason I wanted to do that was because as a city manager in Clearwater, it used to irritate me that we were subsidizing 26% of the population in Pinellas County that lived in the unincorporated area and will receive free police patrols from the sheriff, free uh, uh, local parks, maintenance, uh, road resurfacing and so forth right. that taxpayers in the cities were already paying for and that they were paying for again in their county tax that went all the way to the florida supreme court we won the case and then you had suits all over the state 67 counties uh, eliminating double taxation in florida and i That's will take some small uh, credit for that uh comp of course that's a major major accomplishment. Yeah. You, you touched on a, a, a moment there early on and that in that sort of response was you talked about tenure and you alluded to some, you know, turnover and consistent turnover in 14, 14, 18 months sort of time frame. Well, after Pinellas County, you in our pre-interview, you talked about how you became the Miami-Dade County manager and you stayed in that job you mentioned for 10 years. Nine years. Yeah. A little older than nine years, but nine years. Yeah. So any 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 thoughts on what led one, what led you to getting picked for that job versus many other, you know, worthy competitors? Like why Miami Dade County? What led you do you in your in your opinion, what led you getting that job? And kind of second part to that, if I can throw this one in there, is was there a particular set of accomplishments and skills that you had that you feel made the difference in you getting that job? Because that's a big, big role, big responsibility. Miami Dade County is one of the biggest counties in the country. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, while city manager of Clearwater and county man, uh, administrator of uh, Pinellas, I built a, quite a reputation, which was not foreign to elected officials and people in the know, because I'd spent nine years in Miami. There were a lot of people there that knew me. Right. Um, and I was very involved uh, in the community, in the Chamber of Commerce and other organizations. And, and uh, 
So that helped. Secondly, Steve Clark, who was the mayor of Miami-Dade County, and uh, for many, many years, he also was the mayor in the city of Miami and so forth. And um, he knew me. He was on the planning board in uh, Grapeland Heights when I was uh, working in the uh, in the city in, during those years. And uh, so he was up at the city manager's conference up in, it was up in Toronto or Quebec, I can't remember now. Uh, and he interviewed me there, interviewed several other uh, managers from around the country and went back and recommended to the commission that they hire me. Before that happened, I went on down there. I met with every single commissioner. There were eight commissioners and the mayor one-on-one -on -one. Mm. they were pleased enough that i was selected and the next thing is history i went down spent nine years uh, mm. in my first assignment as county manager what's it what's it like running a six billion dollar government and over and and responsible for and managing the responsibility of twenty-seven thousand employees like What's that like? Well, part of the secret is to surround yourself <clears throat> with real solid professional staff. And um, maybe I'm lucky, but I've got a pretty good record of picking very talented people. Not only talented at the time that they were selected and appointed, but they grew in the position. Yeah. That's one thing. Um I had a reputation as a strong ethical manager. In other words, I didn't play politics. <clears throat> Commissioner asked me a question, they get a straight answer. <clears throat> you never lie to an elected official, never lie to the press. It'll kill you. Right. Um, right. Uh, try to do the right thing. When you're dealing with a, an issue, whether it's a bid, whether it's a new program, what is in the best interest of the city? What is the county, the best interest of the people? That's just given. And whatever that best interest is, as best as I can determine it, that's where I'm headed. That's where I'm going. And I didn't roll over. I mean, I had yeah. some real struggles with some of the commissioners because they would have lobbyists and so forth and pushing to take this bid and get this bid and blah, blah, and so forth. I wouldn't. I wouldn't bend. I'd hang tough. And yeah. uh, once in a while, you lose some. There's some that really became knock down, drag out fights because lobbyists have a lot of influence with elected officials. It's one of the liabilities that we have today. And in, in not only in the state of Florida, other places, but in local government as well. Right. And being consistent because what you're describing is truly your internal set of core values that you probably disseminated across your entire organization which is 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 sort of the lifeblood for how people operate right and then if you hold people accountable to that and you also live them out yourselves you clearly create a network and you create a, a reputation in the industry which clearly impacted where you were able to go across your career um that's well said you, you did meet a lot of famous people along the way. Like we, we kind of got off in the sidebar in our first conversation and you just kind of casually <laughs> threw out, you met three U S presidents and the queen of England. Like I have to talk about that. Like am among them, what presidents did you meet? Did you have any favorites? If you could say one and what's more. And lastly, what's more intimidating meeting a president or a queen. That's not going to make me famous or anything. I mean, it just was happenstance. I, I, uh, my wife and I were invited to um, meet uh, when the Britannia came to port. The uh, Her Royal Highness had a uh, cocktail reception on the vessel, and uh, my wife and I were invited, and uh, we went. She curtsied, I bowed, and uh, shook hands with the Queen, and and. Uh, and then enjoyed the libations. That was just a lovely experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I, di I didn't meet him, but President Kennedy came to the Orange Bowl 
while I was there, and um, he raced through because he was talking to the Cuban American community, the Bay of Pigs uh, situation. That was memorable. I met uh, uh, Bill Clinton, shook hands with him face to face, had an opportunity to talk with him at the Summit of the Americas, which was a huge thing. Every country in South America and the Caribbean came to Miami to talk about hemispheric issues. And uh, uh, the president joined that uh, meeting. Um, oh, um, I met the uh, president, the former football player of uh, Ohio, I think it was, Ohio State, who was, um, I'm going to look at my notes. I made notes here yeah. on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gerald Ford. And I have a picture shaking hands with him. I have a picture shaking hands with President Clinton. That's cool. Now, I do remember, and I, I tried to nail this down, but I remember President Truman coming through Sunbury in Pennsylvania when I was going to Bucknell. Yeah. And I went down to Sunbury, and I think he was on the back of a, uh, at the back of the locomotive. The train pulled in, and he went up there and spoke. And um, and I watched him speak. I never met him or anything, but uh, um, so that those things just happened. <laughs> That's cool, Mayor. What was the hardest part of your job, just in general? If you had to talk about it, just from a general standpoint, like that, looking back over so many years. What was the hardest part? Um, well, it, it's hard to say. I, I had a reputation sometimes when I would read the newspaper and begin to wonder what meeting I was in um, that they were describing um, because it wasn't the meeting that I remember. And uh, that would upset me. I mean, I figured the media holds you responsible, holds me responsible to be ethical, not lie, tell the truth, act professionally, so forth and yep. so on. I expect the same thing from the newspaper. And when you don't get it, then that bothered me. Now, I, I list that. That may not be my first frustration, but that was a frustration. And the, the media knew it. And they would say uh, that I would throw a tirade or whatever um but i uh and that i was too sensitive that was one of the criticisms that i got that i was a little too sensitive i didn't feel like i was but uh, you know maybe i was but i always thought it was for good reason um uh, frustrations too with uh false accusations not just to me but to the county or to my department heads or whatever that was a that was a bit of a, a of a challenge um i don't know i i really love my work i yeah. was dedicated to it i was a bit of a workaholic um you answered going back to one of my strengths was delegation and empowerment i mean i really practiced that judiciously I didn't want people around me that couldn't take responsibility and carry it out. I wanted decisions made at the lowest competent level. I don't want somebody as a department head that won't allow anybody to make a decision. Yeah. You're going to operate that way, go somewhere else. Uh, I want them to delegate and I want them to empower. Um, I can give you memos that I wrote uh, explicitly setting forth my management philosophy. So they knew what I expected and I expected them to carry it out in that fashion. Yep. Um, union negotiations were tough. Sometimes they'd be calling on the commission to fire me and this, that, and the other thing. Um, I had some very tough decisions to make. I fired a 14 year, uh, essentially a police chief. His title was director of public safety um, because number one, there were not enough um, black African-American officers of command level in a, in a 2,700 uh, manpower um, police force, county police force was a big one. And, um, and I didn't like his management philosophy. It didn't agree with me and what, how I operated. He was too autocratic and uh, yeah. too slow in implementing change. So 
I, I had my share of challenges. Uh, and, I don't know and, if I answered your question. I hope no, I no, that, that's great. And I'm going to kind of combine a, a thought here. Um, let's talk a little bit about like controversy, like clearly in like big time roles that you were, where you were in at the at Miami Dade and all, all of the subsequent roles, like there had to be some form of controversy along the way. Like, could you highlight any, any major controversies that you faced along the way that could maybe help those that are listening, like with how you handled that, or maybe something to, to, that they can expect uh, to potentially happen? Like what were some big controversies that you faced? Well, the, uh, where I fired that director of public safety, there were immediately petitions from citizens and organizations that he was in urging the county commission to fire me and uh, bring him back. Uh, and he played golf with the publisher of the Miami Herald. He played golf with my mayor. I mean, uh, I was dealing with uh, someone that had a pretty good reputation in the community, but the community didn't really know how he was running that department and uh, the appointments that he made. And uh, he made commitments to me that he didn't complete and uh, finally got a point. I didn't, I offered, I said, hey, look, take 90 days, go around the country and get another job. And I'll come to your going away party and say nice things. Cause he did do uh, some right things initially. I think the department was corrupt 14 years earlier and he cleaned it up. So, uh, but that was one. I had the second, my second tour as county manager. I'm getting ahead of myself now. I really That's had right. a bear the tail on the bid we had for uh, pay phones at the airport, seaport, and our jails. Bell South had contract on bid for buku years. And I just knew that we could get a better deal, maybe from Bell South, but from other co companies if we put it out for bid. I finally got the commission to go along with that. Yeah. And I mean, it was a knockdown drag out bottle from that point on. Uh, AT&T bid $70 million over seven years, $10 million a year with $10 million up front. Clearly the best bid. Sprint, like $3.9 million or something like that. And yep. Bell South, lowest bid. But Bell South had some powerful lobbyists that were really tied into some of the commissioners and my executive mayor. And they all wanted Bell South to get a piece of it. I said, no. I drew a line in the sand. I mean, yeah. it could have cost me my job. Um, but sometimes you've got issues where you just can't bend. And um, and I took it on. I took it on in the media. I took it on publicly. Yeah. And ultimately, AT&T got the bid. It wasn't fun. Right. But persistence, obviously, paid off in the end, it's clearly. Um, so I think that kind of leads us into just kind of sort of final remarks here. Like what advice would you offer public administrators, you know, people looking to serve in leadership roles in local government, just in summary, like just what advice would you give anyone listening to this show or digesting any bits of this, this content that we'll, we'll obviously share out on multiple different channels, but what advice would you give to people looking to serve in leadership in local government? Well, Number one, I would I would extol the virtues of public service. I would say that anyone in public service, and it doesn't make any difference what they do. I'm talking about people that pick up the garbage, uh, people that patrol the streets, people that protect homes from fire, um, people in public service at whatever level. When you put your head on a pillow at night, you sleep soundly because you have a it's a calling public service is a calling it's like a priest or it's like uh you know people that are really dead teachers that are dedicated to teaching that's a calling and um so it's an honorable profession and it's important it's how cities function and how states function so i'm a champion of public service and i try to extol its virtues and I've had influence on people. People have come to me years later and said, you know, I heard you make that speech and uh, it affected me. 
and I stayed with it, and I'm so glad I did. I, I have a thought here that I just saw that David Lawrence, who's a former publisher of the Herald and a wonderful human being, he said that um, Horace Mann, the godfather of public education, uh, around just before the Civil War, said that be ashamed, you should be ashamed to die before you have won some battle for humanity. Hmm. What a powerful, powerful. Subject, right? Well, Very I would powerful. say to you that people in public service do something for humanity every day. Some do wow. more, some do less. I mean, I've given my life to public service, and I've enjoyed it. It's been a wonderful trip, and it made a lot of people happy. You know, I mean, what else can I say? No, Merritt, that is that's powerful feedback, and and honestly, personally, thank you for your service and all that you've done. Thank you for your candid feedback today. I appreciate your transparency and just willingness to kind of dig deep into not only your background and history and what you've accomplished, but but forward thinking, looking out for for those that are listening to this and and have a lot of the same questions that I had the chance today to ask you. So I appreciate that. I really do. I um, I, I want people to read my book. I'm writing right. a book. It's a, on ethical leadership. Stay tuned. At some point, it'll be published. We'll, the, we'll certainly get that right. link. <laughs> we'll certainly get that link tagged in in the in the comments and in the in the in the content when we get that out. So I, I appreciate that, and we'll we'll definitely make sure our listeners have that information. So thank you. Um, but to all our listeners, thank you again so much for joining us for another episode of the Local Government Insights Podcast, Modernizing Government Leadership. Hopefully you found some value from our conversation today. Please stay tuned uh, for more local government news and insights to come. We really look forward to having you next time. Thanks again.